Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Dave Manoli. Professor Manoli is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, where he is both a clinician and a researcher, a neuroscientist. On the neuroscience side, his lab studies the neurobiological basis of behavior. In particular, they focus on social behavior and attachment and how these things are shaped by experience, how they are related to neuropsychiatric disease. And they study a really interesting model organism called the prairie vole, which is one of the few socially monogamous rodent species out there. They form long, uh, sometimes lifetime pair bonds between the male and the female. Both parents uh, invest a lot in the offspring and their sort of mating and reproductive behavior in many ways actually looks a lot like human beings and other monogamous species. On the clinical side, he actually works at the UCS Early Psychosis Clinic, where he treats patients with childhood psychosis. And so he thinks a lot about how the brain, you know, creates our ability to form social attachments, how behavior is governed in general, but in particular, things like parental behavior and mating or sexual behavior and social behavior between individuals. And, you know, how is the brain orchestrating all of those things? What are the neurobiological and the neural hormonal inputs that sort of sculpt how those things develop in the brain and how behavior is governed by neural circuits in the brain. So he thinks a lot about how the basic research that his lab conducts connects with uh, his work on the clinical side. So that has to do with human and childhood psychiatric illness. We talked about a lot of interesting stuff. We talked about, you know, why some species are monogamous and why some species are promiscuous. We talked about parental behavior and care behavior and how parents and offspring become attached to each other. We talked about how males and females become attached to each other in the courtship process. We talked about, you know, defensive and aggressive behavior behaviors and affiliative behaviors. We talked about things like oxytocin and other hormones like testosterone and estrogen and how those things influence how the brain develops, how some of these social behaviors develop. You know, we talked about everything from menopause in females to in-group versus out-group distinctions. We got into a little bit on how the olfactory system works, how animals can smell things that are floating through the air or smell things like pheromones that are present on other members of their species. We talked about how different parts of the brain express or are sensitive sensitive to things like estrogens and testosterone and oxytocin. We got into some of the details on how those things work at the molecular level and the neural level. And towards the end, we tied some of that into uh, the human side. So, so neuropsychiatric diseases like childhood psychosis, how things that happen early in development can shape how you respond to things or how you behave and perceive the world later in life. And so if you're interested in behavior, broadly speaking, but especially if you're interested in social behavior, that's mating and sexual behavior, parental behavior, um, all of that stuff. How do we think about that in terms of neurons? How do we think about that in terms of ecology and evolution and, and why things have evolved the way they have in different animals? This is a really, really interesting episode that, that covered a lot of ground all the way from the molecular genetics up to the level of psychiatry and psychology. As usual, if you enjoy the content I'm producing, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out mindandmatter.substack.com, as well as the links in the episode description if you want to learn how to support the podcast further. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can make Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase.
Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a product I use called Everyday Dose. They have created excellent coffee and matcha products with functional mushrooms and other supplements and less caffeine than traditional coffee or matcha products. I actually reached out to them because I've been using their product for about a year or so and listeners often ask me about my daily and weekly diet habits. They make a really good mushroom-based coffee alternative. It contains myconutrients with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties as well as collagen protein to help support healthier skin, nails, hair, and joints and the amino acid L-theanine from tea leaves. Each cup has just about 39 milligrams of caffeine. That helps eliminate the caffeine crash that can come if you drink regular coffee, which has much higher caffeine levels. And they use a unique cold extraction process that results in lower acidity than normal coffee. And the caffeine microdose makes it suitable even for someone who doesn't normally drink coffee. This mushroom-based product is made using a double extraction from 100% mushroom fruiting bodies like lion's mane and chaga to maximize the extraction of micronutrients like beta-glucans, tri terpenes, and sterols. Other brands don't typically do this, making Everyday Dose one of the highest quality products of its kind. It's gluten, dairy, and nut-free. There's no added sugar. It's paleo and keto-friendly and made with kosher ingredients. There are no grains or fillers, and it is lab-tested to ensure quality. I really like the taste of Everyday Dose compared to black coffee and other mushroom coffees, and they have a mushroom matcha product loaded with functional mushrooms and collagen proteins, so if you like green tea matcha, you'll probably like that product too. If you're interested in a healthy coffee alternative, I highly recommend recommend giving Everyday Dose a try. Check out the link in the episode description or visit everydaydose.com to learn more. If you go there, you can find special offers that they have for getting a free frother and free travel pack of on-the-go doses with your purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Dave Manoli. who you are and what your lab studies generally? Sure. Um, so my name is Dave Manoli. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UCSF. Um, I'm mostly a basic neuroscientist, um, and my lab works on the neural mechanisms underlying social attachment, everything from sort of the basic molecular biology at you know the individual cellular level for groups of neurons involved in how we build social memories, up to how these circuits function to guide behavior. Um, I'm also a child psychiatrist, and my uh, uh, sort of clinical area of specialty is in early psychosis um, and understanding uh, social deficits that can occur in the context of a number of neurodevelopmental syndromes, but also how they may um, influence or uh, potentially even predict um, the onset of psychiatric disorders later in adolescence or in adulthood. Um, so yeah, I think that probably covers all right, so so you're uh, you're a psychiatrist. You actually see human patients. You also run a basic neuroscience research lab. Is that a mouse lab? What kind of animals do you study? So we use uh, a mouse-like rodent called the prairie vole. Mm. Um, that's just about the size of a hamster. So it's a little bit bigger than a, uh, the sort of average laboratory mouse. And the special thing about prairie voles is that they're in the sort of three to five percent of mammals that are what we call socially monogamous and. So so what that means is that these animals form lifelong uh, bonds between mates, um, and that this is something that endures uh, throughout the throughout adulthood. Um, and another correlate to that is that in addition to actually wanting to spend time with each other, there's a really profound change in their behavior with regards to other potential mates and that they completely reject novel potential mates. So you can imagine there's lots of interesting both neurobiology as well as behavioral biology about how these sorts of um, adaptations to social behavior have evolved, how they occur in the brain. Um, and then uh, one of the other sort of sort of convergences between sort of my clinical interests and our basic science lab is how are these actually influenced by either the genetics associated with neuropsychiatric um, illnesses or early life experience? How does that either um, facilitate, you know, sort of stronger relationships later in life, or how does it actually disrupt the formation of these, you know, when these animals grow up or mm -hmm. if we're talking about people in the context of early life experience? Yeah, I definitely have a lot I want to dig into with respect to the prairie voles because um, they're really interesting and uh, they're also sort of a, a less commonly studied uh, lab animal. So there's a re really a lot of interesting stuff to dig in there. Before we get to that, I wanted to just sort of set things up with some really basic questions. So, you know, as a neuroscientist and a neuroethologist, someone who studies animal behavior, can you just define for everyone? how someone like you would define animal behavior in general and social behavior in particular? 
So, so I, mean, I think the general term animal behavior is really sort of any observational pattern of activity um, at the sort of fine scale level when we're talking about you know sort of simple sequences of movements that sort of comprise what we would call a behavioral sequence to large scale interactions. You know, how does an animal respond to a specific change in its environment to a specific stimulus? Um, so that might contrast sort of spontaneous versus evoked behavior at a very, very macroscopic level. And then when we go into the realm of social behavior, I think at the most liberal definition, it's really how do animals interact with each other, whether we're talking about what we call conspecifics of members of the same species, or for example, if you were to take an animal and its predator or an animal and its prey, interspecific um, interactions. And I think all of those really form sort of this context of social behavior. And, and maybe if it's okay for the, the purposes of the conversation, we can say social behavior is largely um, sort of restricted for the purpose of the conversation to within the species. Um, but I think, especially when it comes to attachment, and, and this may be a direction we go in, you know, there's really interesting intersections between how animals attach to each other. And for example, with certain animals that we come to love in our homes, how they attach to other members or members of other species. Mm. Yeah, no, I can relate to that. I'm actually at my grandma's house right now. And, uh, <laughs> and so there, there's a new puppy here. And so, yeah. so we all know how that goes. You went where I was going, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, um, you actually, you actually wrote, uh, I think you wrote like a news and views for a recent study and you gave, you, you were talking about like the context dependence of behavior, you know, our, our behavior, our behavioral tendencies, uh, change throughout our lifespan. There's developmental processes that go on when, when certain things happen to us. You know, we go through puberty or we have babies or whatever. Uh, our behavior patterns can change. And I think you actually used the example of uh, female elephants to sort of talk about how uh, behavior can really change in quite dramatic ways uh, depending on the external and the internal context of the animal. Could you maybe talk about the elephant example a little bit just to give people, uh, get people thinking about how behavior changes across the lifespan and in different contexts? So, I mean, I think that, you know, really it, it that sort of reflects sort of how hormonal states, for example, or different external stimuli change the state of the animal. And so you can imagine that if we're talking about sort of a fear response, you're going to have a very, very different set of behaviors in the same context than if you're talking about, for example, uh, the display of aggression behavior in the context of territoriality. Or if we're talking about nurturing behavior, right, if we're talking about a mother nurturing its young versus a mother defending its young against a threat, right? And so in the context of each of those sort of defensive behaviors, you're actually sort of seeing similar patterns of behavior displayed in different ways and in different contexts that are really uh, dependent upon the context of the animal that's both sort of influenced by external stimuli, but sort of encoded from the internal state of the animal. And so like when we think about, um, you know, everyone can think of examples in their lives of like when their behavior changes um, okay. for, for like purely internal reasons, right? So you can imagine you know, we all have examples in our own lives where, you know, we're in the same basic context at, you know, time point A in our life. And then at time point B, we're in that context again. Uh, but our behavioral response is very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, you know, one of the things that sort of precipitates some of these changes are all of the hormonal and neural changes that come with, um, you know, the onset of puberty and becoming sexually mature. Another one is, uh, you know, having children or when an animal has babies. So what, you know, how do we start to think about what's driving those changes? Things like, you know, sex hormones and other factors that are circulating throughout the body and, and how it is that they actually start to change behavior. So I think in the context of sex hormones, the, the, there's actually, it's worth taking a little bit of a step back in terms of how we think about the actions of sex hormones on the brain. Um, so the general sort of model, especially when we're talking about mammals, for example, is what we call the sort of um, organization and activation um, model. And the organization part of it is very, very early on. And, you know, for primates, it could be actually even intrauterine probably also for some very, very small aspects of rodent development, but then very early on, you have hormones that differ, right, between males and females in different ways. And as a consequence of that, those hormones have actions in the brain and where those actions generally occur are where there are specific receptors for these hormones. Um, for example, testosterone, estrogen, right? They have um, individual types of receptors that are in not everywhere in the brain, but in specific regions. And so they have developmental consequences. They can wire the brain differently, or at least change the physiology or even the number of neurons in different parts of the brain. In general, when we're thinking about these 
these sort of innate behaviors, we think of the hypothalamus or like sort of the, the most sort of basal um, reptilian brain, as it were, um, that are the most dimorphic or the most different between males and females. And they're organized during this early developmental period. But then there's generally a period where kind of the hormones aren't around, and this is sort of pre-puberty, and then the beginning of puberty, we start to see these hormones come up. And that's where this sort of activation um, sort of um, aspect of the model comes into play, that, you know, not only are these, these circuits now different from a developmental standpoint, but then they're sort of primed or activated to um, elicit or to at least potentiate different types of behaviors. And an important feature is that there is probably a lot of wiring that is involved in the behaviors that, for example, differ between males and females that are common, and that the certain subsets of neurons that are really different influence the um, probability or the likelihood of displaying one or the other. But for the most part, both animals of a, of a species, if we're talking in general about mammals, can do the same sorts of things. They just do it in different contexts. And so that's where the really big difference when it comes to adult social behaviors really manifests. You know, what is the difference between when a female mouse or a mammal um, experiences estrus and then is induced to be reproductively receptive versus, for example, a male who then has testosterone is, uh, you know, induced to mate, you know, with the sort of typical displays of mating behavior that they, that they um, engage in. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what most people think of as the two main sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen? And in particular, you know, the way that people talk about these um, outside of you know, technical fields is testosterone is the male hormone, estrogen is the female hormone. To what extent is that an oversimplification? And where do these hormones come from? How many of them are produced solely by in the, the gonads? And to what extent are some of these things actually made and deployed within the brain itself? So this, is, I think that I'll go to your first point about, you know, the difference between testosterone and estrogen. And so basically, testosterone is a precursor to estrogen. And so um, the simplification of testosterone male, estrogen female is an oversimplification in a number of different ways. And I'm going to focus just more on the sort of behavioral or the neurobiological component. Um, and there's going to be an important distinction between what potentially is happening in primates versus what we've sort of elucidated happens, for example, in mice. Um, but what we found or the, the field found, you know, is that um, estrogen is actually one of the principal masculinizers of the rodent brain early in development. Hmm. And what happens is that um, estrogen is, uh, testosterone is produced and it is locally changed into estrogen in different parts of the brain. There's a specific enzyme that does this that is also very, very restricted. And by virtue of that, circulating testosterone enters the brain, becomes estrogen, and then estrogen works on different parts of the male brain to masculinize it. In females, there really isn't circulating estrogen. There's not circulating testosterone because they don't have male gonads. And so there's in general, what we would say is sort of a default differentiation. There, you know, that's a very, very gross oversimplification, but there is a pathway that happens in the absence of this sort of early estrogen signaling that is sort of the differentiation of the female brain. And so it's, it was very paradoxical when sort of researchers were trying to manipulate these neurons or these, these hormones and actually identified that males that don't respond to estrogen genetically actually were demasculinized. And that sort of gave rise to this aromatase or aromatization hypothesis of how estrogen is actually the masculinizing compound. Now, in primates, there's a little bit more of a difference that happens in terms of how things are occurring in utero. There's also an expansion of the number of neurons and the types of neurons that respond to um, androgen or testosterone via the androgen receptor. And so there's probably a little bit more, not surprisingly, more nuanced differentiation, both of males and females for primates. I see. So, so the reason we can't really just think of testosterone equals male, estrogen equals female, is because even in males, when you have testosterone circulating throughout the blood, it goes into the brain, but then in very specific locations, it sounds like you can, um, in, some, in some parts, in some cases, turn that testosterone into estrogen, and it's actually having a masculinizing effect, you know, correct, making correct. the circuits more male typical or whatever. More male typical, right. And, and it, actually, another important thing that is sort of happening at the same time is that actual process is what actually induces the expression for testosterone, the, of the receptor for testosterone in uh, certain parts of the brain. So estrogen really starts first, and then there's this whole pathway that it then sort of potentiates this um, sort of cycle of differentiation by virtue of causing more places to respond to testosterone. 
I see. So you can have the induction of testosterone receptors by estrogen itself, which then subsequently makes new neurons and new circuits responsive to testosterone later on. Exactly. And and you can imagine with this sort of very nuanced sort of genetic programming in primates, which have a lot more differentiation happening in utero, right? You have actually access to different hormonal surges. And so that balance gets spread out over a much larger period of time. And there's more complicated nuances because of sort of the genetic interactions between estrogen and testosterone signaling in different parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for you know, I guess for, for mammals on average, I guess one question would be like, how, how general are some of these things? How species specific are they? Um, the difference between males and females could, could one way to characterize that would, it sounds like is there is a different pattern of waxing and waning of the sex hormones at, at different phases of development. Is that how we can start to think about it? So I, I think that I would say that that's sort of maybe the the um, conductor, conductor for sort of these processes that to a certain extent, you know, there's part of the score that's been written by mm -hmm. the same players earlier on. And then the the phases of the hormones sort of say, okay, how, what are we going to do in terms of, you know, differentiating the score versus what are we going to do in terms of how it's going to play out, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these early players that sort of, again, this organization, and then depending upon whether you've differentiated in a more male typical or a female typical way, how the hormones influence what's happening in sort of adulthood or adolescence, then that's dictated by these fluctuations. And as, as you sort of uh, alluded to, even the, the hormones themselves have different patterns of fluctuations, right? The, uh, the sort of the estrogen or the estrus hormones go through their own cycle versus testosterone in males tends to have a much more frequent or higher frequency of um, cycling. Interesting. And, and uh, to me, one of the keys so far is that uh, the pattern of, of hormone flux across development actually sets up how sensitive circuits will be to some of these hormones later on. Yeah. And so I, I would imagine there are some pretty big developmental effects there where you know if something happens or doesn't happen at one phase of development, it's then necessarily going to cause some later phase to change how, right. how things yeah. manifest. So the metaphor that's often used is that it sets up the sort of genomic landscape or you know it, it regulates different parts of the genome to then be responsive to these later hormone surges, right? Because these the receptors that we're talking about actually act on DNAs once they bind these hormones. So they're what we call transcription factors. And they dictate both changes in gene expression, but also changes in overall genomic structure. So, you know, places that respond to a hormone early then are primed to either respond or not respond to hormones in a specific way later on in life. And so that also dictates not only how neurons function, but how genes actually are um, mm -hmm. induced or repressed in response to the hormones in adults. I see. So when we're thinking about the effects of sex hormones on behavior and, and how that happens at the molecular level, hormones actually get into the brain, physically go inside of neurons, and they change you know, genes coming on and off and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the one actual tweak to all of this is that, for example, with estrogen, just to make things even more complicated, there's even a receptor that's not one of these transcription factors that's, you know, for example, at, at the surface of a cell that actually changes the physiology of cells in response to estrogen. So there's many, many timescales in which these hormones are affecting a lot of different processes that sort of dictate how a neuron is going to function or respond to other stimuli. Interesting. And how how sensitive are patterns of hormone flux to like environmental in inputs? You know what the animal's doing and what's happening to it at different phases of development. So it it really depends on sort of what are the mechanisms that are trans transferring those signals from the environment into the brain, right? So there are certain hormones, for example, like the ones that you know eventually I think will lead to it, like oxytocin and vasopressin that operate on potentially larger timescales, although they have effects in neurons um, very acutely. You know, and and that that influences sort of the time scale of their responsiveness. But for example, when we're talking about the steroid hormones, the sex, the gonadal uh, steroid hormones, they have actually overlap directly in terms of some of their receptors with stress hormones, like the glucocorticoids. Mm -hmm. And so, th those are operating now on a time scale where we're dramatically influencing patterns of gene expression that aren't happening at like sort of the millisecond time scale, but over you know minutes, hours, days you know, even longer than that. And so you can imagine, de depending upon the developmental context, for example, if we're talking these early developmental situ uh, um, stages, if there's higher levels of stress hormones that are influencing how the steroid hormones can actually even get access to parts of the genome, that can have a very, very dramatic effect that has developmental consequences long-term, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, for example, later in life, 
there are stress hormones, obviously like glucocorticoids, but there are other pathways that influence the dynamics that these circuits can actually um, respond to or how they're responding to other stimuli, whether they're sex hormones or other signals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it would seem obvious then that, you know, depending on what happens to you during development, for example, if you have relatively uh, high levels of stressors versus low levels of stressors, all of these things are going to interact and they're probably going to have like cascading effects on how, you know, subsequent se sexual behavior, social behavior, um, anxiety levels, and, you know, almost everything you can think of will, will sort of manifest later in life. That, that's all. that's perfectly articulated. That's exactly. And, and that's one of the things that we're very interested in, in particular, how it influences sort of the social and attachment aspects, because, you know, I think we know as people, but also there's lots and lots of animal literature that those early experiences have very reproducible and profound effects. So the question is, how does that actually happen at a sort of molecular and circuit level? Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned earlier that you studied prairie voles and I don't think everyone knows this, but I, I think there's probably a good general sense out there that obviously not all animals are monogamous. There's a range of sort of promiscuity with which uh, animals display uh, sexual interactions with conspecifics, with members of their same species. Um, some are very promiscuous and they sort of mate and there's no real attachment that forms between the male and the female beyond that. And then, you know, humans and prairie voles, I think would be, you know, sort of one extreme where we're much more monogamous than the majority of other species. What was that number that you cited for how frequent mono monogamy is in the animal kingdom? So that, that, that's actually, those were, I mean, the earliest estimates were from a researcher named Deborah Kleinman, who in the late seventies, basically estimated about three to 5% of mammals. Mammals. But, but even within mammals, right, there's a huge diversity. So as you mentioned, you know, with primates, there's, there's, um, a slightly higher than average, than sort of across mammals, average of monogamous mating systems. But if we go, for example, to canids, right, there's actually like, um, I think probably now three or four year old um, uh, sort of study slash review, where in the wild, with the exception of domesticated dogs, you do not see canid species that don't display some form of social monogamy, you know, sort mm. of independent of their complex social structure. If we go to like songbirds, outside of mammals, 90% of uh, songbirds are monogamous. And so there's oh, wow. huge variability in terms of um, both just sort of the patterns of mating systems, and then also the sort of the likelihood that a, a species is going to actually display those types of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And when we say monogamy, I, I'm curious to have you define what exactly that means in, in two respects. So one, when we're talking about sexual behavior, does monogamy mean lifelong pair bonding? Does it mean for a season or like some quote unquote long period of time? And then does this only refer to sexual behavior? Can we talk about social monogamy in a more general way? So I think maybe for the purpose of the conversation, I would sort of uh, veer into the realm of social monogamy, right? Because in most systems, you see that if you really look at the, the patterns of the behavior, you see sort of what we'd say extra pair matings, right? And they happen with different frequencies in different contexts. They're actually influenced by different environmental contexts. Um, and so in general, we're talking about sort of the social monogamy that's displayed by a mating pair. Um, and as you sort of alluded to, there are certain species where it's lifelong. And then there are other species where it's basically a reproductive cycle. Um, and, and that varies, you know, again, the frequency and the, and the sort of the, the styles uh, sort of vary across um, different uh, subsets of species, you know, presumably based off of sort of the evolutionary pressures that, that it's evolved in. Yeah. I mean, that, that's actually an interesting question is, um, do we know anything about what some of those evolutionary drivers are? Like, why would some species, uh, you know, want to be monogamous and, and not others? Sure. Um, so I mean, that's a great question. And, and I, I think it's maybe useful to kind of divide it, at least when we think about mammals, um, sort of rodents, or was I going to say primates, and sort of what we call below primates, and then primates and above. And, you know, canids and dogs, you know, there, there may be a separate um, entity. For most species, the largest driving force seems to be sort of female distribution as a consequence of resource scarcity. Mm. So if you take sort of the, so, you know, I think the most recent estimates are at least in mammals, um, maybe 60 to six, six, about 60 times that uh, monogamy has evolved. And if you look at that pattern, you'd seem to have a species that gets distributed over a large territory where resources aren't necessarily abundant, either seasonally or, you know, sort of just geographically. So then, you know, if you're talking about a promiscuous species, the females are sort of left with, you know, raising their young and then having to sort of defend against 
um, you know, intruders, defending against, you know, predators, things like that. And so in that context, there is sort of this evolutionary question that, you know, is influenced by the female, certainly in terms of her wanting to keep a male around, but then the male deciding, is it better for me to risk my op- offspring with this female being killed or dying versus defending them and co-parenting, because that's also a really important feature that sort of co-evolved, is that in almost every of these mammalian species, you see very strong co-parenting behavior, even though they are independent. And so that sort of um, uh, sort of evolutionary toss-up seems to be one of the major, major motivating factors for most mammals that, you know, it, it's in the male's best interest genetically, as well as, you know, sort of resource provision-wise to defend his offspring and his mate against, you know, other potential mates. And, and I see. So if we think about this in terms of uh, like David Attenborough nature documentaries, you know, you see, you see something like, you know, the mother bear and she raises the cubs by herself. And it, she's, I guess basically what you're saying is the reason for that is the bears, as one example, live in environments where the mother is able to get more or less everything she needs food wise, et cetera, for the cubs. And there's really no need for having that second parent there. But other species, I guess humans would be an example. If we live in um, more difficult environments where food is more scarce, you need to have you know both parents either partitioning uh, uh, what they're doing to help rear the young um, and have one or both of them being sort of the ones going out into this sort of more sparse environment and, and bringing things back so that you have everything you need for the offspring. Yeah. So, and, and I think that actually may be part of why there's this distinction between sort of primates and below and primates above is that with uh, primates that are like altricial, right? That, I mean, the young are so, so helpless when they're born. You really need a lot of resources to provide for them for their survival. You know, there's also an, another interesting sort of potential correlate, which is um, that in many, many sort of sort of uh, primate species, or even you know, if we again go back to the canids, you also have multi generational sort of um, sets of um, animals living together, mm. and so there's a much more complicated in in some cases. I don't want to say that this is something that defines the rule. Uh, so there's a lot more. Um, complex social interactions that are mediating sort of who is mating with whom, who can mate with whom, but more importantly, who lives with whom and who protects and shares resources. And so you get a much more complex structure where there is, at least modeling wise, a benefit to sort of having a single mating unit that then sort of creates an intergenerational sort of kinship or family unit. And then depending upon how animals leave that eventually, that sort of sort of helps facilitate them forming their own clan one, you know, with its own numbers and its own sort of ability to provide. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, there's a little bit of a debate between how that really influences and whether that's, you know, cause or consequence. And I, sh- I should also just add that, you know, another factor that comes in, at least to the models of for primates, is this idea of infanticide, right? That, you know, where you and, and certain people sort of have data supported other you know there's contention that where you have species that may also demonstrate infanticide as a consequence potentially of either genetics or resource uh, scarcity that that actually then also facilitates that even more the need for um, sort of biparental care um, to yeah. protect the offspring and sort of yeah I see. So, I mean, the, the, again, using the the David Attenborough method of coming up with examples here, you know, I, I've seen many nature documentaries where um, you have a pride of lions. Right there's there's sort of the dominant male, and he effectively has a harem of females. Eventually, he gets old and feeble enough, and a younger male will come and and sort of take over the pride. And you know, one of the dark aspects for that species is the very often my understanding is that the new male will basically murder all of the infants. Right, right, and and interestingly, in cats there isn't actually a high incidence of monogamy. So th- you know, th- those are some of the data that maybe call into question sort of the primary role of this like sort of in- infanticidal drive. Um, and, and you know, I think it's just, it's a question up for debate. It's also, you know, it's a, it's a phylogenetic question that I think only mm-hmm. more and more data really can sort of help us model better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, um, is the extent to which a species is monogamous um, also influencing the extent to which they are sexually dimorphic, generally speaking? Because I can imagine that if you if you have, let's say humans, for example, and other primates, a truly helpless uh, young baby that needs constant care, you really have to have one parent who's at least one parent who's always going to be there. And then because they always need to be there, they might have different sort of uh, attachment styles, different uh, modes of defensive aggression. And the other parent might be have to be more exploratory, have to be more risk-taking and sort of go out into the world and do different things. Is, is there a relationship there? 
So there is, and actually it's, it, so you're bringing up, I think a really cool part, which is the behavioral dimorphism. But then another interesting thing that, you know, many, many species, whether we're talking about mammals or not, are very sexually dimorphic anatomically, right? You know, like obviously the peacock being one of the best examples, right? That, you know, and there's all sorts of um, sexual selection theory that, you know, is, is, be, or is sort of models why you see such blatant differentiation in, in terms of uh, sexual competition. But one of the interesting features, both anatomically as well as behaviorally, is that when species have evolved to become monogamous, they actually become less dimorphic anatomically. Mm. And then as you were alluding to, for example, from the context of parental behavior, that includes behaviorally. And so one of the models you might that might come up with is that you're actually looking at sort of a de-differentiation from a sex different standpoint of species as they evolve to become monogamous. And one of the things that actually our, our work is actually showing is that that doesn't seem to be the case because when you actually start to look at or manipulate the factors that are facilitating monogamy, you actually see sort of the, the behaviors almost sort of collapse back to more dimorphic behaviors hmm. so that the brain at least has evolved on top of that sort of original dimorphism to converge onto behavioral circuits, for example, with for parental behavior, that even though paternal behavior and maternal behavior, obviously in the absence of, in, with the exception of nursing, look the same, they're actually coming at it from slightly different strategies, at least genetically and presumably neurally as well. Interesting. And I guess that would fit with what I know to be true for humans, which is that if compared to other great apes, we tend to be more monogamous and we're actually, even though we are sexually dimorphic anatomically and behaviorally, we are less so than, you know, gorillas and chimps and so forth. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and that's true even, even for rodents, right? And, you know, if you look at them in the wild, that it's much more, I mean, for us, it's obviously even more difficult to tell sometimes, you know, which is which, but that tends to be the sort of the pattern across phylogeny. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we're thinking all, of all these interesting questions. A lot of them have to do with primates and humans. Um, people are, you know, naturally interested in humans because that's what we are. But of course, you can't really experimentally study humans uh, in very much detail. It's very difficult and time-consuming to do this. But there are other species that happen to be the ones that you work on, where some of these questions uh, can be tackled in a, in a more experimentally uh, rigorous way. So, can you talk to us a little bit about the prairie voles? Um, maybe starting with their natural history and just what we know about their behavior and some of the similarities between them and us. Sure. So, so you know. Pr- from an ecological standpoint, sort of like in the 60s and even a little bit before then, you know, people were very interested in sort of just patterns of animal behavior and, and animal survival, right? And and the original studies were sort of in the like, so, middle of the United States, southern Illinois, um, looking at just the behavior of these animals, trapping them, you know, how, what is their seasonal variation? How does it vary with regards to, you know, rain, resources, things like that? And it was actually studies from um, Lil Getz, who originally, you know, was trapping these animals, you know, when I think he was a postdoc or grad student at that time, or postdoc, um, and noticed that, you know, in certain parts of the fields, like for certain areas um, of these sort of fields in Southern Illinois, instead of trapping like one animal at a time or like a couple of animals at a time, he would often trap two animals at a time. And, you know, then they'd be tagging them. And then if you were likely, so then he noticed that if you were trapping the same animal, you were likely to co-trap the other same animal again. And then they started to look at at these pairs, and it turned out that very frequently, with a much higher frequency than other areas or other species, you would see males and females together. And so that led to this original sort of potential hypothesis that these were animals that, for at least whatever purpose, were sticking together as male-female pairs, which, you know, sort of tends to go along with monogamy. And so that was sort of the original observation that led to this being identified as a monogamous rodent species. And then very soon thereafter, you know, thinking about the sort of now underlying endocrine and and neural mechanisms, uh, a researcher named Sue Carter um, sort of postulated based off of, you know, she's actually, you know, in interviews even said, you know, based off her, her experience as a mother, you know, one of the most profound um, sort of hormones that we have we knew was implicated in maternal bonding was this hormone oxytocin, and that's sort of what gave rise to this entire field of thinking about what is the neuroendocrine um, regulation of what ended up being monogamous mating strategies. But that's sort of where it first came from these original ecological observations long before even we knew that there were hormonal players, let alone what they might be. 
And so the prairie voles, like how do they differ from just sort of the everyday rats and mice that people might see running around outside? Are they living in big social groups underground? Are they sticking together in pairs? What is so, their social so, behavior? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think voles are actually an interesting subset of rodents um, that, you know, one of the questions is, why they may be so uh, convenient for from an evolutionary standpoint that have evolved many many different like in, in terms of monogamy uh, multiple times across actually multiple geographic regions both in the United States as well as other parts of the world and so um, they you know as the name suggests prairie voles come from the prairies where you have again this large distribution with resource scarcity there are closely related montane voles. There are mountain voles, meadow voles, which you know are slightly different um, ecological territories, and you know they've been named. They're bank voles, and you know different types of um, uh, geographic uh, names for some of the species that come from Europe as well. And so, one of the features seems to be that they are very, very good at rapidly differentiating, both physiologically and behaviorally into different ecological niches. And so that's been, from an evolutionary standpoint, an incredibly useful um, set of comparative studies, independent even of when we're thinking about behavior. Um, and as I mentioned, so, you know, they're basically, you know, the same class of rats and, and mice, but they tend to, depending upon their uh, sort of social structure, you know, prairie voles tend to have a den with, you know, at least the litter, and usually you have sort of an adolescent generation that often is sometimes sticking around, sometimes slightly older. They have what's called alloparental care. So they'll mm -hmm. actually care for offspring that aren't necessarily their own biologically. There's, uh, you know, they're yeah. probably genetic as well as behavioral uh, components based off of who you're living with. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it's also like the older, the older sibling, you know, making, making, making you lunch when your parents are at work or something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so for prairie voles, that's sort of the context that they live in. You know, other vole species have, you know, sort of mouse-like social structures. You know, rats tend to be hyper, hyper social, even though they don't necessarily have pair bonding. Um, and so, you know, depending upon the sort of the ecology of where these have evolved to live, they have, you know, very uh, social structures. Mm -hmm. So prairie voles out in the wild, you know, how does the female meet the male? How do they start to form a pair bond? And walk us through what happens, you know, through the courtship phase, through the the offspring phase. Sure. So, you know, I think there's there's a little bit of looking for a mate, right? So, you know, if you're a female, females tend to, both males and females tend to have some sort of territorial um, coverage. Um, males often are the ones that will sort of seek out different territories, in particular if they're wandering away from the nest. Um, and you know, when they encounter a a female. Um, you know, one other interesting evolutionary correlate that I think, you know, we we haven't another kind of looked at in depth in the wild is something called incest avoidance. And so monogamous species also tend not to mate with siblings. And I mean that that's a direction we can go in because you know we've done some work to figure out is that genetic or is it maybe not. But even in the wild, there tends to be this um, likelihood of not mating with a sibling. And so, you know, if both animals are what we call sexually naive, so virgins, then it's really sort of the initial mating that seems to facilitate the both the molecular and the neural mechanisms that cause this pair bond to form. It happens on slightly different timescales, at least when we look at it in the lab. Females tend to be able to form a partner preference, at least, very rapidly within six hours of encountering a male. Males tend to take a little bit longer, you know, depending upon the situation of the study, maybe a day or, or two. Um, and one of the things that seems to be at least um, important is sort of the interaction surrounding mating. And that doesn't necessarily mean like sort of um, successful mating and pregnancy, but rather the sort of mating attempts that stimulate the induction of hormones associated with mating. So for females, it's estrus. These are not cycling animals. They're induced into estrus. And for mm. males, it's presumably some of the hormones that are activated in the context of mating attempts, mm -hmm. potentially being one of them. So again, you know, things happen on different timescales, but some of this can be quite rapid. And I would presume for this species, a lot of this is mediated through olfaction. They're smelling something on the potential partner and you know, whether it's a hormone or a pheromone or something that, that can trigger some of these attachment mechanisms to get started. So I think that may play a little bit more of a role in the identification side of things. Mm. We know at least for females that actually like mating attempts stimulate the induction of some of these hormones. The pheromones are part of this whole equation. They're there. We know that they definitely play a role in priming the animals to be more sexually active, which probably, like you were saying, activates the circuits. Um, and maybe even in a 
maybe with some specificity, but also, you know, certainly with the level of more general activation for mating. And then as the animals spend more time with each other, investigate each other and pheromones in particulars, right? So um, most mammals, you know, other than humans, use sort of two different types of smell. They use olfaction, which is what we are used to smelling things in the air. But then there's also pheromones, which are um, not necessarily volatile. And so they're the direct interactions with, you know, whether it's tears or whether it's, you know, at the animal's bottom, there are pheromones that are specific to these regions that are male and female specific that also probably mediate, at least in large part, how they identify individuals. And so now mm -hmm. we're getting into the sort of the neurobiology of attachment, which is how do I know that this male or this female is different from basically every other male or female? And that's the one that I'm going to attach to. Um, and some of the work that we're actually doing is suggesting that it may not only be olfaction or chemo sensation, that there might be other sensory modalities that they're using and maybe even one sex versus the other to identify who's my mate versus who's not. Interesting. Um, so I was at the dog park yesterday and you know everybody knows when you get a group of dogs together, they walk around and sniff each other's butts. But what right. they're actually doing there to sort of connect this to what you're saying is, uh, my understanding is that there's actually glands that are secreting pheromones and other things. And they need to get right there because as you said, a lot of these things aren't volatile. So they're, right. they're basically identifying individuals by physically putting their nose against things that their, their nose can pick up. Right. And, and these, um, these compounds, right, are, are actually aqueous and they, you know, how they're even perceived at a neural level is via sort of an aqueous medium in a different part of, you know, this general chemosensory pathway, just in the same way, like our nose picks up volatiles. These things pick up uh, compounds that are generally in aqueous sort of environments. So that's, mm -hmm. that, I think the dog analogy is, exactly illustrative of what we're talking about and um you you know you mentioned there's sort of olfaction per se and then there's this other nose-based sense sensory apparatus that has to do with pheromones um everyone has experience with dogs we know that some species like mice you know seem to um they, they use their their sense of smell a lot mm -hmm. um and i know that this gets complicated and a little dicey but in general people characterize primates as being highly visual and that maybe we don't use our nose, at least in quite the way that some other species do. Um, my question is really just before we get into the oxytocin stuff: uh, Do humans actually sense? Do we? Do humans have pheromones? Do we have that mode of of perception? So I would the the safest answer I think, and 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 the answer that I think is probably true is I think the jury's still out. You know, there there are a lot of data that suggest that we do sense sort of chemosensory compounds that are related to our biology, the question as to whether or not they're volatile versus non-volatile. So you know, you're probably aware of, and there are these studies that are associated with like scent of sweat, right? And that how that modulates attraction. And, um, you know, that also, at least in some of the early studies, changes with for women's with, with, their, with their cycle. You know, and for men, it, it varies in terms of like health and things like that, how they, you know, produce some of these, these compounds. And so whether that response is actually coming through what is this sort of accessory olfactory system, or whether it's sort of a modification that humans have to their primary olfactory system, I think is certainly out. You know, we know that there are these sort of, they're not anecdotal. I mean, these are, these are studies that were done in large numbers of individuals, but I think from a sort of neurobiology system standpoint, the jury's still out in terms of whether we genuinely have what we call pheromones in most other species. And, you know, other primates, non-human primates definitely seem to have, or certain subsets of them definitely seem to have preservation of the, the system that we're talking about. And so I think it's still a question of how much do we rely on those versus are they potentially there? Maybe they influence us in ways that, you know, we haven't really teased out for a lot of the reasons that you were alluding to in terms of, well, you can't do these experiments in humans. Um, but in general, primates tend to be more visual. And, you know, I think that potentially is the analogy in terms of how we think about the sensory systems involved mm -hmm. in identifying a mate versus, you know, somebody mm -hmm. else. Okay, so um, going back to the prairie voles, uh, you know, boy meets girl, they hit it off, um, and they start mating, and then the female gets pregnant. So after she gets pregnant, how do the behaviors of the male and female start to change? So it's actually even before they get pregnant, and even mm -hmm. independent of pregnancy, um, and so. Interesting. There is, there's an interesting component that, you know, I think is a separate set of biology associated with pregnancy, in particular, what happens in the male brain following, you know, either the hormone signals when a, the female is pregnant or even after delivery 
of pups. And there's an interesting, uh, we were, you know, we were talking about infanticide. So there is this, um, in rodents, at least what's called the infanticide clock, that if a male mates, and then there are pups around about three weeks after, he's not infanticidal towards them because the likelihood is that those are his pups. And so we know that there are hormone signals that sort of um, are communicated or perceived by the male surrounding pregnancy and mating. But for bonding, that doesn't seem to be a requirement. So within those first few days, you know, independent of pregnancy, whatever it is that happens from a neuroendocrine and neural perspective um, between males and females that are induced during these original or these initial social and mating interactions um, triggers two things. And those are sort of the principal components of what we call sort of um, from the social behavior standpoint, pair bonding between the two animals. One is that the animals develop a preference for each other over now other animals of the opposite sex. So when you actually test them and give them a choice, they go to their intent or their now, you know, however we want to call it betrothed or um, uh, bonded partner in, in contrast to spending time with the um, stranger animal. The other part of this though, is this flip that I was talking about in terms of the rejection behavior. It's not just that they actually prefer. When confronted, for example, with just a novel individual, they actually will actively reject these animals. So it's basically a sort of display. And I don't want to use the term aggression because I think aggression is different than this sort of rejection. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of behavioral overlap when you just sort of look at the behaviors. And one of the questions is, is there neurally overlap between aggression versus this rejection behavior? But you can imagine from an evolutionary standpoint, you're kind of going against basically 4 billion years of evolution that says mate, 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 to say, okay, even though you have almost all of the same signals as my partner, I'm actually going to actively reject you. And so those are the sort of two predominant components of what we of what pair bonding really results in and manifests as. Interesting. And then um so then when they have offspring, what what's going on and what's going on behaviorally and what's going on underneath the hood that uh that is underlying the sort of attachment phase of the parent with the babies. So behaviorally both parents will actually demonstrate really really robust parental behavior, right? I mean the one exception that's different is nursing, right? But mm -hmm. both animals actually will crouch over the pups in the nest, providing warmth, providing protection. You know, both of them will actually groom them. Both of them will kind of attend to them. Both of them respond, for example, when a pup is separated from the nest to actually retrieve it. Um, and that's, you know, a response that's generally guided by the pups vocalizing. And so you really see sort of a significant parallel um, pattern of parental behavior between the maternal and the paternal behaviors. What's happening under the hood is a really good question. And that's actually one of the questions that we're we're interested in pursuing is how does, you know, in the context of this pair bonding, how do we get the um, demonstration of these behaviors in particular in males, right? Maternal behavior is sort of generally expressed across mammals, you know, with varying levels of sort of um, fidelity in terms of when and how, how robust uh, mothers display these behaviors. But paternal parental behavior is pretty, pretty much an exception, unless we're talking about biparental care. And so, you know, as I was, I was talking about whether or not this is co-evolution onto kind of a common final pathway, or in some way, shape or form, these circuits, which maybe existed in males, but weren't necessarily active, have now been co-opted by these signals, mm -hmm. by virtue of this bonding circuitry, molecularly and, and neurally. That's an open question. I see. So, so both parents take care of the young. Uh, they do the same types of behaviors. It could be that there's sort of a shared uh, set of neural mechanisms underlying both, or it could be that sort of the male brain and the female brain have uh, done it in different ways. Right. Right. Interesting. So, um, how long does it take for the young to grow up? And what are the you know when do things like oxytocin come into the picture? And what exactly are they doing? Oof, that's okay. Very big question. So, I, you know, I think the question of when oxytocin comes into play varies on what, what behaviors we're talking about. And so, you know, we know from many, many, many different species that oxytocin is involved in parental and pup sort of attachment, in particular maternal attachment. But, you know, certainly we would argue that it's probably also playing a very, very, very large role and pharmacology supports that for paternal attachment as well. And so then, you know, these animals basically are about, they, they grow up for three weeks, at which point, at least in the laboratory, we can then basically what we call wean them. So they're then basically self-sufficient. They can eat on their own. They 
you know, can sort of take care of themselves. They are social species. And so this is another interesting question is that if you actually isolate them from siblings, there are different developmental consequences. And so that the period of adolescence, which kind of goes from about, you know, three to let's say four, five, or maybe six, seven weeks, depending upon the situation, laboratory, or, you know, sort of the, the context, um, is a period in which these animals actually form peer attachments that can be even between between members of the same sex or interestingly actually between sort of siblings whether they're actually genetic or non-genetic so if you raise these animals together they'll form attachments to each other and that intersex um, attachment actually has a potential role for what we were talking about with terms of incest avoidance mm-hmm. that it may not matter whether you're genetically related but if you're ra- if you grow up together you become familiar and attached to each other, but then that sort of leads to you not necessarily wanting to mate with each other. I see. So there's probably some kind of fingerprint, whether it's olfaction-based or something, and it's not necessarily just to do with your genes. And there's right. there's something exactly. that's in-group versus out-group distinction, basically. So, okay, and, and that's basically sort of the other part of all of this is within group, without group, and how how is that communicated, right? Um, but at least at the first approximation in the lab, it's not genetically dependent um, and something that's coming from environmental you know, cues or sensory cues exchanged between the individuals. And so then after sort of, you know, you have, again, this organization activation, the gonadal hormones sort of kick in, you have sort of the final sexual differentiation of the nervous system and behavior, and then these animals are now reproductively active, right? And so that is where now the sort of phenomenon re- restarts of bonding between individuals that mate with each other. They do preserve those sort of um, peer affiliations from that early adolescent period. So, you know, animals will show a same-sex preference um, for animals that they're familiar with versus um, non-familiar with. But then in terms of mating, that's what sort of uh, results in the pair bonding for Mm -hmm. the next generation. And the likelihood is actually based off of pharmacology that things like oxytocin and vasopressin are playing a role at each of these stages Mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. different ways and presumably on different subsets of these Mm -hmm. neural circuits. Can you talk about for people like what is oxytocin? What kind of molecule is it and how does it work at the cellular level? So it's it's a hormone, but unlike, for example, the steroid hormones that we were talking about, you know, made by the gonads, it's a peptide hormone. So it's a nine peptide hormone. Um, it's very closely related to another nine peptide hormone, vasopressin. They both seem to have um, diverged from a common uh, precursor that's actually conserved, you know, across phylogeny, even like, you know, worms have um, these precursors. And mm-hmm. so um, these hormones are, um, they're made from sort of larger peptides and then they're cut into smaller pieces in different neuroendocrine populations of neurons within the, in most cases, the hypothalamus. Um, The one that we often talk about is something called the paraventricular uh, nucleus. It's it's a principal source in most mammals of both of these hormones, as well as other um, uh, peptide hormones as well, uh, even though it's not the only one. And so these hormones are made and they go through in, in sort of two directions, literally. Part of it is into the periphery, which is secreted via the pituitary, and they govern physiology sort of throughout the body. You know, they're involved in partruition, they're involved in various aspects of lactation, things like that. But then when we're talking about this in the context of pair bonding, they're actually secreted synaptically to mm. regulate the activity of neurons sort of postsynaptically. And these hormones bind to what are called G protein coupled receptors. And they're sort of the largest family of uh, receptors sort of in the genome. And by virtue of the binding of these peptides to these horm- uh, to these receptors, there are intracellular processes like molecular um, events that happen, enzymatic events that change the levels of certain molecules that influence both how uh, a cell or a neuron in this case can respond to other signals, as well as the baseline physiology of those cells. Interesting. Okay. So these things are peptide hormones. So they're basically small proteins. And part of what they do at least is to basically act, at least in certain cases, like a neurotransmitter. Right. Exactly. And they fall into this category of neurotransmitters called neuromodulators. And so right, they, they're often sort of coupled with some of the more direct excitation versus inhibition neurotransmitters to really sort of influence how the signaling is actually happening at a synaptic level. Mm -hmm. And so I I imagine that you guys and others have done experiments, you know, with the prairie voles, you know, probably with other species as well, where you're sort of adding more oxytocin at, you know, some time when it's not supposed to be surging or you're taking it away at a time when it is. So what's, how do some of these attachment and parental and other behaviors 
uh, change in response to you know adding more oxytocin or taking it away and things like this? So that was sort of the foundational aspect of the field is, you know, based on those original observations that, that Sue Carter made about the fact that it seems to play a role, people started to manipulate. The other part of this is actually people also started to compare, and that's a, that's a different direction that I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a second. But when they started to manipulate oxytocin, either like you were saying, giving it in the context of um, social situations where it might not yet have been released or wasn't released but for a shorter period of time versus blocking it. And, you know, there are drugs that can do both of them and, you know, fairly specific drugs that really, you know, either you can give exogenous oxytocin, which you know, pre predominantly acts as the oxytocin receptor or a, a drug that blocks it. It had what, you know, sort of the predicted effects based off of what we think these drugs, these uh, molecules are doing. When you gave oxytocin to animals that were put together for a shorter period of time, they developed a partner preference, you know, very quickly relative to animals that got like just a vehicle. Similarly, when you gave either systemically or then by virtue of those other studies that I was talking about, local either oxytocin to facilitate or blockers to prevent it from working, you basically disrupted the formation of these pair bonds. So if you put animals together and you kept on giving them an oxytocin antagonist, you prevented pair bond formation. And interestingly, similar similar findings were found in slightly different contexts for vasopressin, this other related hormone that has its own receptor. And so um, what happens when you take away oxytocin or the ability of the body to respond to it? It depends who you ask in terms of the animal and the species. Um, and so that was the experiment that we did is um, if it's okay, I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a side note and talk about the, the receptor distribution and kind of why that the receptor question is actually a really important one too. Ah, okay, so, perfect. So like where the receptor is in the brain. Exactly. And so because, you know, people were really hypothesizing that oxytocin and, and then vasopressin were playing a really big role in these behaviors, they looked to see, okay, are these genes different? Are the, are the neurons that make them really different between a monogamous vole species, like a prairie vole versus a promiscuous species, let's say a meadow vole or a montane vole. And when you look at the peptides, they're very subtle differences, but there really aren't major differences. But as you were, as you were speaking to, peptides act on receptors. And so by virtue of, you know, the hormones having very large regions where they project to, they then looked at where are the receptors for oxytocin or vasopressin in a monogamous versus a promiscuous species. And that's what sort of blew up in the field was that if you look at a monogamous species and multiple monogamous rodent species, for example, you see that the oxytocin receptor or the vasopressin receptor are reproducibly in different parts of the brain in monogamous species than in promiscuous species. Mm. And some of those parts of the brain are ones that you can create pretty good models for involved uh, their involvement in reinforcing different types of behaviors. So for example, the nucleus accumbens, which is involved in reward reinforcement, also of, uh, involved in sort of aversive um, reinforcement as well, expresses lots of, or has a lot of oxytocin binding mm. in, a in a monogamous yeah. species. So, so just, just to really simplify that, the way I guess you, a cartoon way of thinking about that would be, so nucleus accumbens, people usually think about dopamine, they think about drug addiction, you know, people get addicted to their kids, parents, it's as if you're addicted to your offspring. Is that, you know, how you would start to think about why you might have an oxytocin receptor there? Sure. And, and yeah, that's exactly how, and, and you know, that's, that's sort of the model that it's, you know, you have to reinforce these behaviors in order to make, you know, facilitate their, prop, you know, them for being beneficial to the animal or for the animal to actually want to engage in them. I shouldn't say, I mean, the benefit is the evolutionary side of things. And, you know, all of the associated circuits the parts of the prefrontal cortex, right? How do I, like, where do I keep the um, sort of initial or, or the long-term memory of my partner, parts of the other parts of the limbic system that are involved both in mating aggression, as well as just our response to sort of social stimuli. So we've, there was this really, really profound difference in terms of where it appeared oxytocin was, and vasopressin were acting in a monogamous versus a promiscuous species. So that set the stage for you know all of the, the studies that really said, okay, can we start to, for example, initially, um, because prairie voles weren't mice and didn't have all of the genetic tools, can we start to pharmacologically manipulate oxytocin or vasopressin in these different subregions of the brain to really say, okay, how are, this, how are these different regions or different parts of the circuitry contributing to aspects of this pair bonding behavior? And that's sort of what, um, you know, 30 years plus years of work has really sort of um, demonstrated that, you know, different regions are contributing in slightly different ways, um, but that in for um, by and large, when you for example, inhibit oxytocin or vasopressin in some of these regions, you really significantly impair the animal's ability to pair bond. 
And so that led to the experiments that we have uh, recently, uh, or not recently, we were, we've been working on this for quite some time, um, that we did, was, which was to bring molecular genetics to the prairie vole. And part of that is kind of motivated by my own sort of way of thinking about innate behavior. And that's, I, I come from this molecular genetic perspective, thinking about using the genetics of a species to really identify the neurons that are involved in innate social behaviors, right? And so, again, because the receptor is in these different places, it points you to the different parts of the brain that might be involved in social attachment. Mm-hmm. But variables weren't mice. You know, they didn't have the decades of molecular genetics and cellular biology and embryo embryology um, that sort of has allowed us to really develop tons and tons of tools in mice and sort of other quote unquote model organisms. You know, there were a species that really was, you know, they were had a rich behavioral history, rich pharmacologic history, but we didn't have the ability to genetically manipulate them. So we developed those tools using um, CRISPR-Cas9 eventually. And you know, there was, there was a, precursor to that of, of you know, six, five or six years um, that we can or don't need to go into. But we used uh, CRISPR technology to, in this case, knock out the oxytocin receptor for two reasons. One was just as a proof of principle that we could genetically manipulate things in a prairie bowl and then really start to do sort of the next level of molecular genetics and neurobiology in the species to really get at the circuits and genes involved in pair bonding. And then also, you know, to sort of just ask the question, which we expected a very specific answer that, you know, what is the genetic requirement for oxytocin receptor signaling for pair bonding? With the idea being that it would have a pretty significant impact on the ability of these animals to form. I see. So before we get to the result there, yeah. So the every expectation I think people would have is we know oxytocin is important for some of these things. We know that the distribution of receptors in different parts of the brain is different between monogamous animals and non-monogamous animals. Obviously, uh, you would imagine that if you get rid of the oxytocin receptor, something major is going to happen. Before you describe that result, so you used CRISPR to get rid of this receptor in prairie voles. Did you did you just knock it out completely everywhere, or did you do it for certain brain regions, or, or both? So the first experiment that we did was to knock it out everywhere, and so we we made what's what's called a knockout animal, um, and that that again from the proof of principle standpoint is the sort of the principal technology that allows us to develop all of these tools in mice from a transgenic perspective, right? So you can use things like viruses to manipulate genes in certain ways, but at the end of the day, you need to make different forms of different genes, uh, different alleles, right? Either to conditionally manipulate them, like you were saying, in different parts of the brain, um, or you know, to build tools to label neurons by virtue of the genes that they express. And that's sort of what's led to the revolution in molecular and circuit neuroscience in mice is because we can define circuits based off of the genes that they express, define populations of neurons based off of the genes they express, and then manipulate them using the sort of intersection of these two types of technologies. And so what we did was to really spend a lot of time being able to bring CRISPR into the vole embryo. Um, and that involved just a lot of time understanding how vole embryos develop, what's the biology, you know, at the other end of the animal instead of the brain, that really allows you to manipulate them at a genomic or, you know, sort of genetic level. Mm-hmm. So eventually you guys figure it out, uh, you get the technology to work, you knock out the oxytocin receptor, what happens? So we were surprised that not as much happened as we initially ex- expected. So, you know, we I, I often talk about now that my postdoc, you know, who was doing a lot of the studies, um, we made the animals. Initially, there weren't any obvious phenotypes, like they, they, you know, they, you know, they didn't have severe growth de- deficits or anything like that. Which, you know, I don't know that you would necessarily expect um, with loss of oxytocin receptor. But then you know, we, uh, we sort of what we'd say cleaned them up genetically, and then started to look at their behavior, and we're actually quite surprised that when we looked at the behavior of animals that had been put together for a significant period of time, they showed very, very robust partner preference. Mm. Um, and then in collaboration with sort of actually uh, the lab that I, my, the mentor that I did my postdoc with and our collaborator, uh, Sun Rasha and Karen Bales, we, you know, we looked at multiple alleles and we started to look at different aspects of their uh, pair bonding and parental behavior and found that they do, do develop very, very robust partner preference and demonstrate very robust parental behavior, um, which, you know, I think based off of the pharmacology, I would say was a little bit of a surprise. Um, because there was really this sort of idea that, you know, from the perspective of disrupting oxytocin signaling or facilitating it acutely, you really had profound changes in the ability of these animals or the propensity of these animals to form pair bonds. But then at a genetic level, clearly that wasn't the case. You know, I will say that 
we are looking at other aspects of the behavior and perhaps not surprisingly as a sort of a neurogeneticist we see that the genetic architecture of pair bonding behavior actually is you know it's multifaceted right and so whereas this initial disruption wasn't something that's prominent there are discrete modules that do seem to be dependent upon oxytocin receptor signaling what isn't the case is the ability to form a preference for your partner mm. okay so a lot of these behaviors are intact even in an oxytocin if you get rid of the oxytocin receptor everywhere using this crispr technology but you just said that there were there were some things that were disrupt, disrupted what were those so how they so the the sort of two areas where we're really focusing is on the reciprocal behaviors between these animals right so how do animals actually interact initially between each other eventually they clearly can form a partner preference but mm -hmm. are there actually subtle differences in sort mm -hmm. of the social interactions that they engage in you know, if, if one of the animals is lacking the oxytocin receptor and the other one isn't like do can they detect it do they behave differently with one versus the other how is that happening and so mm -hmm. there is definitely this sort of overall effect in terms of probably the patterns of social interactions that facilitate pair bonding are altered even though the animals eventually can form mm -hmm. this partner preference and so um so yeah, it's a surprising result. Sort of the the naive expectation I think most people would have had is okay, if we get rid of the oxytocin receptor, we're sort of going to break all of these uh, behaviors that we've been talking about. But you generally don't see that. And where my mind goes with this, you know, I started my training in evolutionary developmental biology, and you know, one of the sort of core things that that I learned from that era of my life was. Um, the relationship between redundancy and robustness in development. So a lot of times, you know, you'll have multiple copies of a gene or a protein or something, and these things are highly overlapping in terms of what they're doing and where they are. And the basic idea is, you know, development is complicated. It needs to go right, and there's lots of ways and and places it can break. But if you've got multiple redundant versions of things, if one of them breaks, you've got a backup basically. And so you mentioned earlier that there's this other thing called vasopressin. It's also this sort of peptide that's very similar. Do you think something maybe is going on here where you've got redundant peptides that can compensate when one is gone? So uh, there's, there's sort of two questions there. And one is sort of the redundancy from the peptide perspective, but then this is actually also talking about the receptor. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, we're, we, we'd sort of be making the argument that vasopressin receptor may now be sort of playing the role for where oxytocin the oxytocin receptor was. We didn't see that. When okay. we looked for sort of significant changes in the vasopressin receptor expression in the oxytocin receptor mutants, we didn't see that. You know, there may be in very, very specific subregions, a place where vasopressin upregulation or receptor upregulation is, or even where it is generally, is somehow responding to oxytocin. But at a global level, that's not where we're seeing the redundancy. I think what probably, you know, um, apropos of your your point from an evolutionary perspective is, you know, these are behaviors that are absolutely critical to the species, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is a fundamental difference between disrupting a neuromodulator in an otherwise wild type animal that's developed with all of the neural and developmental homeostasis that allows it to be a functioning wild type animal. And then you come in and you dramatically alter the function of these circuits versus, as you were suggesting, when you don't have the gene itself from the get-go, there are redundant or compensatory mechanisms. And you know that's an open question is one, one of the things we're looking at is what are the changes in gene expression that happen plus or minus the oxytocin receptor that compensate for the absence of oxytocin receptor signaling. And you know, again, I say that we were surprised, but you know, I think if we take a step back from, so again, from an evolutionary perspective, you're not gonna have a single point of failure, right? Mm -hmm. these, these animals have to have robust systems or evolution would suggest that they need robust systems to really make sure that they can maintain themselves and propagate, right? And so it's not going to be that suddenly if a single signaling pathway is slightly disrupted, or in this case, globally disrupted, that they can't still facilitate uh, their reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that this is a direction things will go as the technology develops and gets more and more precise, but just in sort of molecular developmental genetics, broadly speaking, you often see differences in experiments where you know, you do a whole gene knockout right from the beginning, and that sort of gives space, for, so to speak, to the body to come up with as much compensation as possible versus, you know, you start to develop ways to knock out the gene in one place at like a very well-defined window of development. Do you think that's where things are going to go and that you'll probably sort of unmask uh, some more significant phenotypes when you do those more kind of spatio-temporally so targeted? I, I 
Yes. So I think the short answer is yes. And I, that's certainly the direction that we, we would like to go in is to be able to manipulate the neuron, or the, the receptor expression, you know, after an animal has had the chance to develop and see what are the effects, um, you know, sort of with local distribution or even developmental. I mean, you could do it both ways, right? And, you know, to your point about the more sort of both subtle phenotypes, but also more maybe profound effects is, you know, there are other aspects, like I mentioned this, you know, the flip in rejection behavior, right? That seem to have more of a, um, uh, the oxytocin receptor signal seems to have more of a role there. And so I think both in terms of what the global knockout is really showing us is that there is this sort of circuit slash genetic separation in terms of how these aspects of attachment behavior are being regulated. But I think the, you know, the question of what happens when we just take it out in the context of an adult animal is a really, really important one. Um, and also is, is you know, these are all orthogonal in terms of really understanding what are these circuits doing, what are they responding to, and then, you know, both at a sort of global circuit level, but also at a synaptic level, what is oxytocin receptor signaling doing in different subsets? Because even though the receptor is the same, there's only one receptor in the genome, mm. it's going to have different effects depending upon the cell type that it's in, whether, yep. it, you know, I mean, both molecularly within the cell, but also, um, if it's the same receptor that's doing the same thing, but it's going to have different consequences, but also different cell types. Like if you have it in an inhibitory neuron versus an excitatory neuron versus a serotonergic neuron, you, know, you can imagine all of these things will have very, very different readouts for behavior. Mm -hmm. So going back to behavior and, and the natural ecology, the prairie voles, and trying to tie a couple of things together. So we talked about earlier how sort of one theoretical reason to explain like why monogamy evolves in certain lineages has to do with resource scarcity basically um and we've talked a little bit about um you know we've talked about pair bonding in group versus out group distinction incest avoidance things like that so like with all of that stuff in mind i can imagine that okay you've got a pair of prairie voles they've got a litter the litter um they raise the litter and you know it becomes time for for the kids to to venture off into the world on their own and on the one hand you know you want to take care of your offspring they're your offspring of course on the other hand if you're a prairie vole and you've specifically evolved this reproductive strategy because of resource scarcity you know at some point you've got too many mouths to feed and maybe you need to kick uh kick the little ones out of the nest um in fact i, I used to have pet parakeets and one of the behaviors i, I observed when um, when I enabled them to have a nest and mate is, you know, the mother would, they, they would both, there was by parental care. Um, the mother would stay in the nest the whole time, but at, at some point the babies got big enough and loud enough and hungry enough that she just said, she ba basically became aggressive and she would attack them until they left. Um, do you see that type of thing with prairie voles? Do they sort of actively make their young go away? So in the wild, there definitely seems to be something that facilitates the sort of the older um, young from leaving the nest. There hasn't been very, very reproducible documentation of aggression per se. Mm -hmm. And it may actually coincide with the young leaving when there is larger resource availability to then go find their own territory. But to what you're talking about, that is actually something that's seen, for example, in, in dog canid species, is that you actually have at some point in time the, you have reproductive suppression by the, the mating pair so that they actually, the, the, the subordinates don't mate until, like you said, the nest gets too big. And then they actually, they're ones that are kind of have a higher likelihood of mating that then they force out for exactly that purpose. That also allows those animals to then go start their own sort of nest and clan. And so with variables in the, in the laboratory, we don't really encounter that to the certain extent because a, there's not huge resource scarcity and we, we don't try to use that as a manipulation, but we also remove it. The, you know, the young from the nest at some point in time, unless we're specifically looking for this alloparental care. In the wild, you know, I, I would not be surprised if there is some level of sort of behavioral modulation of how they sort of deal with that in the context of either too many pups in the nest or when resources become scarce. But it's not something that we, that we actively see. And in part, that's also because they develop, they demonstrate such robust alloparental care, right? So in many cases, you actually see that they're sort of taking care of the family, mm. even though they're not necessarily reproductively active. I see. And, um, you know, one of the things that characterizes a lot of species is, you know, when, when the mother has offspring, she obviously becomes 
very attached to the offspring and cares for them. But simultaneously, mothers will often become hyper uh, aggressive or defensive, at least um, towards intruders, right? They don't want, you know, the classic example is like I, you know, my family's from Michigan um, and my parents live in Northern Michigan. So everyone knows about bears up there. And basically what everyone understands is, you know, black bears are mostly not a threat most of the time. They're not going to bother you. They'll typically avoid you unless they're starving. The major exception being if the mother's with her cubs, in which case you just need to get the hell out of there. Right, right. So I came to that, the elephant example that you brought yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about oxytocin. So with that in mind, you know, oxytocin, the sort of cartoon version that you see, you know, out in magazines and stuff is it's the love hormone, it's the cuddle hormone, it's just sort of the signal that makes you love whoever's around you. But I also know that there's some work out there, and I'm not super familiar with the details, that it might have a role to play specifically in the sort of in-group, out-group distinction thing where it's sort of, if you're in the in-group, you're going to be more altruistic and and uh, display care behaviors and things like this. But if you're in the out group, people or, or animals might be more aggressive or more selective and things like this. Is that true? And and what do we know there? So that that's certainly true. And you know, I think the example is you know, I think the closest example is maternal aggression, right? And and the the fact that, for example, the the mother will defend against any intruder except for her partner. Right in terms of the, or I shouldn't say any intruder that isn't some somebody that she is familiar with, right? So other offspring that are part of the, the clan are um, not somebody that she'll fight against. But a mother will very, very actively defend against any potential intruder, male or female, into the territory. And the same thing seems to be true, you know. I would say with some of the studies that have been done in humans. In terms of in-group, out-group, you know, there have been some studies looking at, for example, people who are in relationships who, um, you know, if given um, oxytocin, actually show a stronger aversion to an attractive member of the opposite sex, mm. you know, because it facilitates what you're saying, this, this sort of othering. And, you know, I, I don't, th- that's a term that has a lot of weight in different contexts, you know, both in sort of the psychology literature, the sociology literature. So I, I want to be very careful about using that. But I think that what we're seeing is exactly is what, what you're talking about is that you're amplifying the response to familiarity from different contexts, whether it's mm. your offspring, whether it's your mate, it's your siblings. But as a consequence of that, you're also filtering with a higher signal to noise ratio, anything that's not familiar, right? Mm-hmm. So anything that is the other, which then be, which becomes very important for, for example, your response to a novel mate, right? How do I identify my mate versus another mate? They're going to be subtle differences. You know, for us, we think everybody's face is so unique. They are, but probably to a vault, it's, you know, a, you know, a primate that looks basically the same. Mm-hmm. Similarly, you know, for us, there are going to be subtle differences between the vault's pheromonal profile, but those need to be amplified for an animal to identify, obviously, with other behavioral contexts and cues. This is my mate versus this is not my mate. And if it's not my mate, then I actually evoke a very, very different behavioral response, which is this rejection behavior. So I think that that, that is exactly the neurobiology that, that operates at multiple levels, depending upon how complex the social group is. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So they, they've done experiments in humans where you basically give exogenous oxytocin and people become more averse or at least less attracted to attractive members of the opposite sex. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say there's the, the one caveat that, you know, sort of the internasal oxytocin is still its own sort of debate in terms of how much of it actually gets there, but it did have an effect. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak to whether or not I you know, the, the the biology of what happens when you give intranasal oxytocin, but that has been an observation in humans. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, wow. So Sorry, what, I just, oh, go ahead. You, you just reminded me of another thing. You know, the other place where people have sort of looked at oxytocin is for example, in like um, people who are really, really into certain sports teams. Right. And so far as you can actually <laughs> monitor in that context, you know, your, your team scores a goal, people, people's oxytocin levels actually do go up. And right, I mean, that's been something that's yeah. reproduced, in, obviously, in sort of smaller clinical situations, but seems to be the case. And also makes you, you know, the higher the level of oxytocin you have, the more likely you are to then demonstrate some sort of aversion towards the other team, right? And so this idea that it's it's amplifying responses of who I'm with versus who I might not be with is pretty consistent. I see. Yeah. And uh, I'll let everyone uh, ponder their own examples from their own life of, of the sports and in-group versus out-group uh, behaviors. Say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's a, it's a really fun area to think about. Um, I want to ask you about, so uh, we'll, I guess we'll stick with the prairie bulls unless we should go somewhere else for this. But 
you know, what happens when you disrupt one way or another some of these parent offspring interactions um, and the offspring are not getting the kind of parental care that they're supposed to be getting in a normal ecological circumstance? Uh, what happens, what does that do to the subsequent so- social and sexual behavior of the offspring when there's some kind of deficit in parental care? So, so, and I think you you already alluded to that. This is something you can start with sort of independent of variables, right? So there's been great studies from Michael Meany beginning, um, and that was actually looking at innate differences in how rat moms sort of took care of their pups and um, showed that pups who were the offspring of high grooming versus low grooming being sort of like the sort of extreme measures of the, those initial groups um, actually had reproducible patterns of parental behavior themselves. This is in particular for females. And so that, you know, female pups from high grooming mothers grew up to be sort of from the rat literature, good parents. They they showed very, very um, attentive parental behavior, good pup retrieval, and a lot of grooming behavior versus female parents who, or female pups who were from low grooming moms grew up to be low groomers. And also, you know, sort of that persisted. They also had other parental behaviors that, you know, showed a deficit. And so there's certainly a reproducibility and sort of a a transmission of these behavioral consequences by virtue of these early life experiences. Similarly, in the context of, you know, both parental behavior and now kind of moving into perivals, parental deprivation has pretty significant effects and reproducible effects on late life patterns, both of um, just general social behaviors, as well as pair bonding and parental behaviors. Um, You know, one of the things that we're also very interested in is, you know, parental deprivation is incredibly severe, right? And we know from clinical populations, even in the absence of sort of the nutritional um, deprivation that can also be, you know, a consequence of isolation. But if you take that away, for example, the Romanian orphanage studies, right, which where you had individuals where they had all of the nutrition provided, but didn't have the socialization. In some cases, when we're talking about the kids that were there from the earliest stages of life, they developed what you know those clinicians call, called pseudo-autism, a very, very, very profound um, set of uh, disruptions in their social cognition and social behavior, in addition to sort of other um, clinical uh, sequelae. The same thing is also true in, in animal models. When you talk about this parental deprivation, it's a very profound effect. So then the question is, can we start to separate out the stages of social deprivation and also the specific effects of social isolation or social deprivation from other types of stress, right? Like thermal or things like that. And so that's actually something that, you know, we and others are starting to look at in variables and are finding that there are these very reproducible effects that if animals are sort of socially isolated at even later stages of their life, but, you know, prior to adulthood, it does affect their propensity to form pair bonds. It also affects their propensity to, again, have this rejection behavior. So mm-hmm. sometimes it becomes, in fact, hypersocial and, you know, will form a preference if given a choice, but then also if, you know, just confronted with a new individual, they're totally willing to mate with that individual. And there's also interesting differences between the sexes for how these things play out. Yeah. Can you go into a little bit more detail there and maybe talk about an example or two? Sure. So, you know, for example, if we take animals that, um, like, so, animals that are socially deprived uh, early, early in, in adulthood, not necessarily complete parental deprivation, but, you know, mm-hmm. periods of social isolation. A, do, you just mean, do you just mean sort of you're not allowing the parents to be there for some fraction of the time? Right. So you can, you, you can do that, like sort of uh, individual um, or periods of isolation, or sometimes what people have done is, you know, very, very rigorously tried to say, okay, we're going to give them warmth, we're going to give them nutrition, but we're going to take away the social context, right? The, the actual per- parent, um, which again, you know, they're, how you measure the severity of the stress, I think is, you know, that's its own question. And if you look at what happens to those animals, you know, in some cases, what you see is that, for example, the females will form a pair bond, you know, if again, given a choice, even though it's, you know, the the strength of that pair bond may be, um, depending on metrics, less severe. But then if you give them a male, a novel male without their partner, they actually treat that as they would a novel animal, like not having been bonded. So they don't, they don't reject him. Exactly. Exactly. And in some contexts, you see it's almost the opposite in males that they sometimes become very asocial or actually, you know, depending upon the model or how you're testing it, they may be more anxious. So they're not more um, pro-social, even in terms of the initial um, social interactions that lead to pair bonding. So they take longer, they, have a less sort of um, robust pair bond 
Um, and then depending upon the context and the level of stress, sometimes you see the similar phenotype to females where they become hypersocial. Sometimes you actually see that they're even more rejecting that. So they have sort mm. of this hyper um, attached, even though it's less social phenotype. I see. So, so, per, so in general, it seems to be that whether you're male or female, an exact pattern will differ between the sexes. Not having the parent there as much, being deprived of parental interaction, seems to push them to one end or the other of the distribution of normal uh, prairieville social behavior. Right, right. And that's consistent with those studies in rats where, you know, when you had the females that were sort of raised by the sort of the low grooming moms, they not only were not not necessarily the best moms, but they were also, they had much more um, frequent mating. So they would abandon their pups at an earlier time point in order to mate and then mate and mate and mate. Mm, Interesting. Um, There's a couple directions we could go with that. I mean, one, one is a little bit more theoretical. I know that there's some ideas out there on... Basically, you take the concept, which a lot of people learn about in grade school, of R versus K selection. So, like, you know, so you have some species like humans, um, for those listening, where we're sort of one extreme uh, example where, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into our offspring. You know, so you have to really, you know, babies are helpless. You have to be there and invest years and years and years of, uh, resource allocation and attention and care to them. Whereas you think about something like a salmon swimming in a river, there's none whatsoever, right? The females just lay eggs and the males just sort of, you know, put their sperm in the water and they try to have as many babies as possible, knowing that there's going to be no investment and most of them will die. Can we think about some of these behaviors within a single mammalian species like this, where one, one of some of these things that you're describing that we think of as deficits or something could also be thought of as different types of strategies for different types of environments with different levels of investment. And and I think that's a really, really important point to make is, you know, especially when we start to analogize some of these behaviors to humans is, you know, these things have evolved for many, many different selective pressures, right? And so the context in which what we call sort of a deficit in behavior may actually, in, in a, there's sort of these evolutionary theories of various neuropsychiatric conditions and why certain things manifest in different contexts, which, you know, that's its own conversation. But I think that what you're getting at is that, you know, the the plasticity of the circuitry is, is there, right? And in different contexts, you're going to have a different adaptive strategy for survival, like within a species. So there's, there's kind of the, the intraspecies versus the interspecies comparison that you were making, right? So we know that promiscuous species tend to have larger litters, Right, because mm-hmm. of sort of that phenomenon that you're you're alluding to, that you know it, it may be to their benefit just to put as many offspring out there as they can, hope that they survive, and you know, good. Versus a species where you have biparental care and you're investing inordinate amounts of resources into the offspring that you have, they actually have fewer offspring as a consequence of that. But in the context of either environmental or sort of social stresses, it may actually be very adaptive. You know, for whatever reason, if, you know, there's a couple more hawks in the area and your parents are, you know, getting picked off, you know, left and right, it may actually make more sense to sort of adopt a a very different mating strategy in order to propagate your, your genome. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, your work is really interesting because you're, you're studying these prairie voles, this very interesting rodent species and doing this basic research, but you're also a psychiatrist. And, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to anthropomorphize too much when you're talking about rodents. You don't want to uh, overgeneralize the findings from from one species and one slice of the uh, experimental uh, field that you're in. On the other hand, you know there are some really interesting parallels between the prairie voles and the humans, and it's really hard not to think about how some of this applies to many, many human circumstances that probably come up as people are, are listening to what you're talking about. Um, how do you start to use your basic research findings to think about human neuro- neuropsychiatric conditions and, and social deficits and things like that? So I think there's a, there's a couple of ways that I think about it. You know, one is you know, certainly actually the, you know, the very basic question is what's the point of studying these behaviors, even though we can sort of, you know, anthropomorphize or, or make analogies at a behavioral level is, is that really biologically useful? Right. And that kind of goes to the point that, um, you know, I mentioned that when we look at sort of monogamous rodent species, you see sort of convergence on oxytocin and vasopressin, but that seems to be a cross sort of phylogeny that when species have evolved or just even sort of diverged different social strategies, these peptides come up more, you know, often, if not every time. And so, and then when we start to look at mammals, whether or not it's more oxytocin, more vasopressin, or, more, you know, maybe even a different hormone, you see these conservations of kind of converging on brain regions, converging on 
molecular path neuromodulatory pathways. So there's at least that prima facie sort of analogy that says, okay, there's some utility in terms of understanding the biology of how we are as social species as a social species by in an animal model where we can really understand their social biology. Then there's also the sort of the genetic and the sort of circuit aspect of it. And you know, as we're sort of exploring more and more, we see that there are similar patterns of genetic sensitivity to in perivals using the technology that we have to some of the sort of well-established genetic contributions to different neuropsychiatric disorders in humans. And so again, from bio biological standpoint, there is the ability to say, okay, at least we're looking at something that may be a really, really significant distillation of how complex social behavior is in, in humans, but there's some patterns that are emerging in terms of what's happening. And that's where I think the importance of any work in a basic science model is for psychiatry is, you know, it allows us to generate hypothesis, not only about what's happening, but how do we treat, you know, a given uh, set of conditions, right? Whether it's, you know, talking about, you know, the sort of social aspects of depression, social aspects of anxiety. My interest, as I mentioned, is in early psychosis. And, you know, one of the things that we are very, very lacking in terms of treatment in, in that population is what we call negative symptoms, the social cognition and social um, components that are impaired in different populations. And so really trying to think about how can we even think about the biology, let alone a treatment for some of these neuropsychiatric conditions, that's where I think the, a lot of the utility of understanding the basic science is. Mm -hmm. And you know, historically, psychiatry has, like many other fields of medicine initially, it's been a lot of trials in, in different patients to see what worked. But more recently, you know, we now have some of the first drugs that are based off of hypothesis driven basic science. Actually, what you know, the first one was actually a hormone based drug for postpartum depression that was based off of what was known about the biology of partuition, what happened, you know, in for, in, for women and mothers immediately postpartum, and how does that potentially correlate with what's seen in, in patients with postpartum depression, which led to the development of a drug specifically for that? So I think that's how sort of the general aspects of thinking about this from a neuropsychiatric standpoint come into play. Hmm. And that, that drug for postpartum depression, what is it exactly and, and how does it work? Uh, it's brexanolone, um, which is it's a, you know, it's a steroid hormone analog that is one of the um, metabolites that changes very dramatically postpartum. And different populations of, of women postpartum had different drops, basically. And it was noticed that the, the most significant drop um, in brexanolone, or it, it's the, the uh, hormone analog, um, correlated for women who had postpartum depression. And so then this analog was developed specifically in this context and actually you know, has gone through FDA approval and now is actually sort of one of the major treatments for that. Well, how, uh, how well does it work? I mean, very well. I mean, you know, no psychiatric medication works as well as some of the other ones, but it actually, you know, it's well above placebo and it actually in, in specific populations of women with postpartum depression is incredibly effective, right? And it's it's one aspect of the myriad of biology in this very, very specific, you know, context um, for for women. So, but I, I think that's actually sort of alluding to why I think the basic science is so important. You know, I mean, as humans, we are very diverse biologically and genetically. And so, you know, the problem in psychiatry is that it's very hard to identify a patient population that shares the same biology, even though they may sh share the same symptoms, right? Mm. The symptoms are just external, not arbitrary. And I, you know, I, I don't in any way want to sort of minimize the importance of really understanding how symptoms present, but the, the pathways that lead to somehow how, how symptoms present are very diverse. And so being able to then say, look, if I take a population that has sort of behaviorally the same sets of symptoms, can I start to understand what the underlying biology is and how it may be different, you know, between different populations to say a treatment that works in this, this group of patients may not actually work. And mm -hmm. I don't want to have to just try it. I want to be able to say, can I identify who may respond better versus mm -hmm. who, who might not? Yeah. So in the time remaining, I want to talk a little bit more about your clinical practice. So I think you mentioned that you study um, childhood psychosis. Um, can you describe so I'm, not a, I'm not a clinical researcher, but my so, yeah, the clinic that I'm in is basically um, we, we work with kids sort of across the spectrum of um, various conditions that are starting to show or starting to report what fall into this category of psychotic symptoms. Yeah. What um 
what is psychosis? Um, that, that term can trip people up sometimes. So let's talk yeah. about what that means. So when we use the term psychosis, and it's a, uh, you know, I apologize, I'm going to start to sound a little bit like, like, like I sound in the clinic. It's a very broad term that has no one specific cause. And so, you know, when we use the term psychosis, it can include things like hallucinations with auditory, visual, uh, you know, actually olfactory hallucinations are the most common. Um, it can include things like paranoid thoughts. It can include things like delusions. Um, it can include disruptions to cognition. So what we call sort of just disorganized thinking, also slowing of cognition, blocking of cognition. So those, these are now some, some things that are in this negative symptom component. It also includes in the context of some of these illnesses, disruptions to social cognition, either being able to perceive social signals, express them, or sort of integrate them into a social context, right? And the important fact is that you don't have to have all of these, you can have various combinations of them that sort of generally fall into this category of what are sort of psychotic psychotic or psychotic-like symptoms. And then the other part of it is importantly, there's no single cause, right? You know, many, many kids actually report these symptoms and there's not, it's part of just natural stages of development. Obviously, as many of us are familiar with, people can have hallucinations of things because of drugs and, you know, and mm -hmm. because of pharmacologic things, because of fevers, you can have many of these symptoms and also because of various psychiatric conditions like depression, like schizophrenia, you know, like bipolar disorder. So all of these can actually sort of manifest in different contexts with this general set of symptoms that we call psychosis. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the real problem is when some of these things are actually showing up in, in at an inappropriate time or in an inappropriate way, in a way that's not typical, and or they persist longer than they might um, you just sort of sporadically pop up for for the average kid. Is that more or less accurate? And and the one thing I would also add is when they're disruptive, right? Because yep. it's it's possible that some of these symptoms can actually occur, and they're not disruptive because people have either learned to cope or they're just not you know intrusive in a way that actually disrupts their ability to to function, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, that's the latter category, obviously, from the perspective of a clinician, that really brings somebody to our clinic, right? To say that this is really interfering with, you know, my, my child's life or my life. And now we have to figure out how to, how to help them. Are there any, you know, obviously there's a lot of diversity to this, as you said, both in how the stuff shows up and, and what's driving it. But when you talk about childhood psychosis, broadly speaking, are there any forms of this that are more, that you see more common commonly? Um, or or are, there, are there any things that are becoming more common in recent years? And if so, what are they? So I, I would say that, you know, sort of in terms of the, the patients that we see, there is not a single common thing that really sort of unifies even a majority of patients. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I will say that there's certain neurodevelopmental syndromes that have a higher likelihood of presenting with psychotic symptoms. So I think, you know, probably the, the example that's most commonly understood is autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder, right? And autism by itself is an incredibly large spectrum Um but we, what we do know is that where you have um, children with a diagnosis of autism, there is both genetically and sort of you know epidemiologically a higher risk for the development of psychotic symptoms. Um, so that's one context in which we see sort of a sensitization. And you know for the for the children that do develop them, they tend to develop them a little bit earlier than kids without a diagnosis of autism. Um, you know, and but they also share very similar patterns. You know, in, sort of independent of that. Um, so I think that might be one where you could sort of say, okay, there's there's a potential sens sensitivity or sensitization, you know, because of the factors that contribute there. But, you know, I mean, these symptoms can be reported across the spectrum in terms of um, early life trauma can, can lead to this. That by itself is a risk factor for the development of what we call these formal psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia. It, it can contribute. And, you know, there's a whole interaction, like we talked about, about development and stress and the vulnerabilities of the brain that, you know, again, um, Bring it brings a lot of biology and a lot of sort of human um, experience um, to the question of what what is causative. Um, and then there's one other thing that I was going to say that I've now kind of forgotten um, in terms of oh, and then sorry, in the context of just very complex medical illnesses, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and when anyone is very sick, you know, you, you may have had the experience of somebody who's in the hospital who has psychotic experiences, you know, like consistent with delirium because they're just very ill. The same thing can happen when a child is just very sick, you know, either because of a condition or just happens to be very ill for various different reasons. They can develop because their brains are developing, you know, potential sensitivity to some of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. Do psychotic like symptoms, um, do they happen more frequently at certain like developmental transitions or phases? So like, for example, 
um, you know, when you talk about like the onset of puberty for, you know, colloquially we say, uh, oh, teenagers, their hormones are raging. And we, we talk about it that way, but your hormonal patterns really are changing. And, you know, we've all had, had the experience growing up of, you know, going through some of these transitions and, you know, different aspects of your psychology and your behavior are changing. Do you see sort of, um, transient increases in things like psychotic like symptoms at certain periods of childhood or adolescent development? So I'm, I'm going to sort of separate that question in terms of when we're talking about a clinical population versus not. So prior to puberty, you know, in, in during childhood, children will very like 70% plus of children will report some sort of psychotic, like I hear something or I saw something, right? Mm-hmm. And it's whether it's part of fantasy play, whether it's, you know, just part of the biology of their developing brain, it's within the realm of normal child development. And, you know, there's no, for the kids that do versus the kids that don't, there's no late life or you know, later life sequelae. But to, to the point that you're talking about, what we do know is for, for example, um, what we call these formal psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia, mm-hmm. there is a very significant role for adolescent development. And we assume gonadal hormones because there's a difference between how males and females develop it. The other correlate in terms of the gonadal hormones in particular is there is a second peak for women around menopause Mm. in terms of the development of some of these psychotic symptoms or psychotic illnesses. And so the trajectory that we find is that, you know, kids often, and and this is actually one of my my interests in terms of understanding the, the social biology, is to identify are there predictive factors prior to the onset of some of these more, um, more um, common sort of presentations that we associate with, for example, with schizophrenia, like hallucinations or delusions and paranoia that happen once adolescence starts. And it tends to be that for males, they're a little bit more sensitive earlier versus for females, they tend to be a little bit offset um, a little bit later. And so, you know, when you're teaching this, um, you know, to sort of medical students, like sort of the way that you sort of think about it is for males, you often see that the sort of peak um, in these symptoms, even though it's preceded by a couple of years is right around high school graduations around 18. So 16 Mm -hmm. to 18 is where you sort of start to see the the big peak happening for males and for females, maybe around college graduation. So offset by two to to four years. And but then as a consequence of that, and there's a lot of um, active work trying to understand, is it because it's happening earlier for males that they tend to have more severe symptoms? Or is it that there's actually differences in terms of how the gonadal hormones are working in one context versus the other that causes different severity? I mean, you can imagine the more time a brain has had to develop in the absence of some of these processes or stresses, the better off it is and more resilient it is. That one explanatory model. We also know that there seems to be an effect of, um, you know, it's a female protective effect of potentially estrogen and other hormones that may then explain why menopause is the second sort of peak for women in, th- in terms of the um, onset or presentation of some of these symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, one last question before we wrap up, because um, it just occurred to me and it kind of connects a couple of things that, we, that we've talked about this whole time. So you're just talking about menopause, the sort of phase later in life that, that females have. And we talked earlier about prairie voles and monogamous species and species that um, have intergenerational cohabitation and alloparental behavior. Um, so my, with all those things in mind, my question is, um, what, what is the point of menopause? Why would you, why, why would a species even evolve something like that? So that, I think that's, that's an excellent question. And I, you know, there are many, many evolutionary theories about the, the, the point of uh, menopause, which I, I certainly don't have my own, you know, I think that one of the ways in which it's viewed is that there is a metabolic benefit potentially to not having the normal reproductive cycle after a certain point of time, in particular, where you have the potential for increased genetic sensitivity or susceptibility. But you also then have species that outlive their reproductive age that have a value of sticking around, right? Whether it's this intergenerational providing of care, certainly in the context of more complex species where you have intergenerational transmission of information, which is what we call culture, Mm -hmm. right? And so the benefits to that and the evolutionary forces that might lead one to the other, you know, I think are very, very complicated. But for example, I think that is one mechanism that may explain some, some contribution to why menopause has evolved. And, um, you know, obviously it's going to be different in a context of all of the associated physiologic changes that are detrimental, right? So then what, what is the, the um, sort of evolutionary cost of that versus, you know, actually just keeping the hormone cycle going 
Okay. And my understanding is that there's few species where you have female menopause. Humans, I think whales, elephants, it tends to be this sort of yeah. highly social, long-lived, multi-generational. Right. Exactly. And and so I think you're you're highlighting a very important point. Part of it is longevity, but obviously you need longevity to have interne- intergenerational transmission of information. And so, you know, if we can start to tease out, you know, if we have long-lived species that don't enter it, what are the forces that actually might contribute? You know, another interesting point is at least when we look at whales and elephants, they're very matrilineal societies, right? Or, or mm. groups. And so that may be one of the pressures that sort of evolves to sort of, you know, uh, influence some, you know, sort of the development of these physiologic processes. Well, um, Dr. Manoli, I want to thank you for your time. This has been fascinating. Uh, I mean, I could I could keep going for quite a while on some of this stuff. Is there anything that you want to reiterate that we went over or anything you want to tie together? We covered quite a bit of ground. We did. <laughs> so it's a good question. You know, I mean, I think just, um, you know, apropos of a kind of like the most recent stuff that we've been doing, you know, I think it, it is actually a really, really cool time to be doing what we're doing um, in part from the genetics, you know, exactly where I come from, but also, you know, thinking about how many different factors contribute to something as complicated as attachment, right? And And now the fact that we are uncovering that there is this entire, I don't know to say Pandora's box, but you know, we're, we've lifted up the hood. And I think that there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going to come out of that. Um, in addition to thinking about, like, you know, how experience, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about was attachment is an experience dependent critical period, right? As opposed to many other aspects of development. And so I think that that's going to be a really, really interesting way of thinking about sort of the biology mm-hmm. between all of this. And I don't, I don't normally ask guests for book recommendations, but you know, when it comes to this topic, it's so sort of rich and broad. You know, when we think about social attachment and social behavior, whether it's more on the biological side or the psychiatric side or the psychological side, are there any books or resources that you would recommend where people can start to dig into this stuff more? I mean, you know, to be honest, I actually think starting sort of the original founders of sort of human attachment theory, Bowlby and Ainsworth, you know, they've been, their work is actually incredibly accessible. And Hmm. then anything that sort of takes that into different contexts. Um, you know, there are many people who have sort of, you know, adapted it, but I, to be honest, I would actually say some of the original work um, is is worth reading because they, you know, they were presenting theories to people that they really had to convince. And so they did a very good job of mm-hmm. both presenting the evidence, but also framing it in the context of some of the evolutionary theories that they were basing it off of. Um, and I, I, you know, it's rare that I would say go back to the original, you know, because there are many people who sort of distill it, but I actually think that there are some of the few that really did a good job of presenting those theories. And what were those names again? Uh, John Boldy and Mary Ainsworth. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, interesting. Rec- an interesting recommendation. Um, so again, thank you for your time. This has been fascinating. Uh, Professor Manoli, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. I really, really enjoyed it.